Hello, hello, it's Dr. Karen here. I hope you're doing well today. Today we get to talk about histamine intolerance. Woohoo! Uh, today's masterclass is called Histamine Intolerance, Three Common Causes to Allergies All Year Round. Now, histamine intolerance maybe is a term that you're unfamiliar with, but it's more common than we think. You might actually know uh, someone who has histamine intolerance. Maybe you have it yourself. And I think that we'll probably be seeing it uh, more and more in the future, uh, these kinds of histamine issues. So my hope for today is to give you an introduction about what histamine intolerance is, some of the common causes that contribute to developing histamine intolerance, um, and how you can identify histamine intolerance, and of course, what to do about it. The, and the, really the punchline here is the good news is that it responds well to nutrition and lifestyle modifications. So that's always great. So let me just start off by asking you a few questions. Do you get skin flushing or indigestion after drinking alcohol or other foods? And maybe this is something that's a little bit newer for you. You tolerated those foods in the past and now you don't. Do you feel worse after eating even healthy foods like fermented foods, uh, sauerkraut, uh, bone broth, kimchi, uh, kombucha? Do you feel like you have a lower tolerance to more and more foods? Do you get headaches? after eating, nasal congestion, do you get anxiety or insomnia? Do you have bad menstrual cramps? You certainly don't have to have all of these symptoms to have histamine intolerance, but many of them are related to histamine issues. Now, histamine intolerance, as you can see here, some of the symptoms can be very mild and some of them can be severe, but most of the time they're developing gradually. Uh, could be over a few weeks, months, or even years. They're often tolerated, and often I hear people just calling them just allergies. Um, and so even in my family, uh, we are uh, susceptible to seasonal allergies. But a lot of us, even um, in the winter time, have these kind of allergy types of nasal congestion in the morning, for example. Um, so these kinds of things might be related to histamine. Uh, one of the things that, the one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about it today is that histamine intolerance, um, mild or severe symptoms could be indicating a deeper imbalance. Um, and I'll, I'll go more into what I mean by that, but it could be a little a red flag saying that there's something else that's, that's getting out of balance that needs to be addressed. Um, as I was mentioning before, histamine intolerance, the term itself, we're less familiar with. I think most people have heard about gluten intolerance or lactose intolerance, um, but histamine intolerance tends to fly under the radar a little bit. So um, hopefully I can give you some uh, more information about it so that you can identify it um, uh, by those, those symptoms. Okay, so some of the um, Histamine intolerance can mimic a lot of different things, as I was mentioning, seasonal allergies, but it can also mimic things like food allergies, um, anxiety, IBS, even PMS. So it can be a little bit difficult to identify with that. Um, and un unfortunately, due to the increasingly toxic environment that we're living in and other parts of our modern lifestyle, um, Many of these things actually contribute to making histamine intolerance uh, develop and also make it worse. Um, and I will go into some of those causes. Um, so I think we're, because of that, I think we're going to keep seeing more and more of that. Um, so I hope that I can help you just be able to identify this um, and show you how to get started on addressing the symptoms and those deeper imbalances as well. So first of all, let's just talk about histamine. What is histamine? Um, some of us who have seasonal allergies and have taken antihistamines are familiar with uh, what histamines are. What histamine is, is this chemical that's triggered, um, released by the mast cells by our immune system. So these are specialized cells in the immune system 
that when triggered by an allergy or other triggers, they release this histamine into our bloodstream. So these mast cells are a little bit like protective guards uh, of our body. And when they see something that looks like a threat, they're going to trigger this um, kind of like an alarm system by releasing this histamine into the bloodstream. And that tells you know, the rest of the body uh, to do all these different kinds of things to get ready to uh, address that threat. So histamine can activate a lot of different receptors in the body. So they can activate receptors in the gut, in the brain, in the lungs, in the skin, um, in the heart even. So your symptoms will really depend on which set of receptors are activated. Uh, for example, in the gut, uh, the histamine stimulates the production of stomach acid. So some people see that with uh, a little bit of alcohol and triggering the, the gut receptors and getting also this flush on their uh, face as well. In the airway system, histamine stimulates the constriction of the throat um, they can cause runny nose and watery eyes as well. So again, this is why it looks a lot like, you know, seasonal allergies, um, and it is part of that system too. So how do you know if then you have histamine intolerance? One of the big first steps when you're suspecting histamine, histamine intolerance is to uh, rule out true allergies because histamine is part of the allergy reaction pathway. So um, to do this, this would be um, a true allergy is something that's caused by an IgE antibody. So this is something you can test um, through your allergist. Uh, the test looks kind of like they're pricking a skin, uh, that kind of test to rule out that there isn't a, a true allergy happening here because um, our histamine is definitely involved in that as well. But you can also have reactions uh, without an allergy and still have histamine reactions. Generally, when, when it comes to histamine intolerance reactions, they're not life threatening them, um, which is great news, but it can still be very alarming. They can still negatively impact our lives. So here are some of the common symptoms of histamine intolerance, and again, you it depends on which receptors are activated, so you don't have to have all of these symptoms, um, but most people have maybe one or two groups that tend to keep getting activated. So starting with the skin, so skin flush, as I mentioned, after alcohol or other foods, hives, rashes, and itch, and that itch doesn't always come with a rash. It can just be itchy. Uh, you can have headache or brain fog, uh, mood changes like anxiety or depression. You have nasal itch or congestion, throat itch or swelling, wheezing, shortness of breath. You can have indigestion like diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, bloating, reflux, anxiety, difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep, migraines, uh, including premenstrual, so right before or at the onset of your period, uh, even puffiness in the hands, blood pressure being unstable. Mostly I'm seeing this as blood pressure being low, causing lightheadedness, could be racing heart as well. Um, menstrual cramps, as I mentioned, heavier bleeding, uh, even bladder irritability and frequency, assuming that there's no infection there, can be triggered by histamine. So many of these symptoms can be triggered by eating certain foods. Not always, and I'll describe why it's not always, but. Um, just remember that many of these can also be a, a result of true allergies, so make sure to rule that out uh, first. Because there can be lower tolerance to more and more foods, a lot of people with histamine intolerance, we end up thinking that the problem is the food itself, and we start taking out certain foods until we have this more and more restrictive diet. and. Uh, generally that's, although it does help to minimize the triggering of histamine, in the end that's not what we want to do. We want to actually address the reason why we're triggered so easily and maintain lots of variety in our diet. So what then is histamine intolerance? Generally it is too much histamine in the body versus not enough getting out or broken down. So 
high histamine levels are due to too much histamine coming into the body via food from eating foods that have histamine or by your body producing histamine generally in reaction to something else and then that equation has to be balanced out with how much histamine is actually being broken down and eliminated so when that scale is off and there's too much histamine left in the body that's when we can have histamine intolerance issues so it's a little bit like filling up a water in a bucket small increases of histamine may not be noticeable until you reach this critical point where the bucket overflows and then then you see those symptoms uh, triggered so those um, those with histamine intolerance tend to have this chronically full bucket so symptoms are more easily triggered say if the you know next time they have a bite of some food that has high histamine levels for example now I mentioned the antihistamines that uh, some of us are familiar with. There's a few different kinds, mainly the ones we're seeing um, pretty commonly used is the H2 uh, histamine 2 antihistamine or H2 blockers. Um, maybe you've heard of Zantac, for example, it's often used for reflux. And then there's the other kind that's um, H1 blockers, which is more like Claritin or uh, Benadryl, these other kinds of histamine. Um, antihistamines that are good for like, seasonal allergies, for example. They can help to reduce the symptoms in many individuals that have these high histamine uh, levels in the body. However, you're probably aware of some of the potential side effects, um, like getting sleepy or dopey, but also the continuous use of these can actually lead to more uh, histamine production by the body, as well as a greater need for medication in the long term. So for a long term solution, they're, they're not the best solution. So what then is causing the, your body to not be able to break down the histamine very well? Because this is a really important part of this. What breaks down histamine in the body are generally these two enzymes that are really, really important. Um, they're called by their actor, acronym HNMT or DAO. These are two enzymes. The, the HNMT enzyme is found in the brain and all over the body and is more genetically influenced. Um, so maybe this is a, a big reason why we tend to see uh, histamine symptoms kind of run in families. Um, DAO enzyme also genetically influenced, but more influenced by the gut and the reason is that DAO enzyme uh, actually is responsible for uh, breaking down histamine that ends up in our food. Um, it's actually produced in our gut, that enzyme. So what's happening in our gut is really gonna impact that DAO enzyme function. So I'll talk about this more in a moment, but basically damage to the gut can reduce your DAO enzyme and reduce your ability to break down histamine uh, efficiently. Okay, so what are these three common causes then to histamine intolerance? These are the common ones that I see. Um, the first one being stress or adrenal issues. So we're talking about more chronic stress issues. Uh, second one being estrogen dominance and third one being damage to the gut lining like I just mentioned. So the first one being stress, adrenal issues. You may have already noticed that when you're stressed, like you realize that you're running late and you're suddenly feeling flustered and you get flush in your face or you get that racing heart, histamine is involved in that reaction. Uh, histamine can really is con uh, contributes to that stress reaction. Remember that histamine is really, it's part of your uh, protective or defensive system in your body. It's there to, to help you. Um, chronic stress or adrenal dysfunction. So these are things that are stresses that are going on for a longer time that affect our ability to uh, be resilient to stress. When there's that issue going on, then we tend to have a lower tolerance to stress and we can be triggered more easily 
by even things that seem like small stresses. So that means that we're actually gonna activate that histamine even more than if we were in imbalance, right? So uh, a lot of stress management practices can be super helpful for histamine uh, intolerance because of this connection between that nervous system and histamine. So um, in my uh, video notes today, I'll add in some links to breathing uh, exercise videos, meditation, um, and information about acupuncture, for example, can be really good for just calming down that nervous system, uh, retraining that nervous system, essentially, to be more uh, resilient. And of course, we've talked about adrenal function in the past as well. A lot of lifestyle recommendations and improving good quality sleep, for example, having a good circadian rhythm, that day and night rhythm, so important for adrenal function. Can be a, it could be a huge game changer. Um, and that can be really helpful, again, for uh, preventing that release of histamine. Toxins is another form of stress to our cells. Um, we've talked about all about toxins uh, last month, but we have toxins all around us in our environment, uh, including at work and at home. Um, there's off-gassing from the new couch and furniture. Um, there's off-gassing from new carpet. There's the fragrances and candles and beauty products that we buy, uh, cleaning products. Um, there's toxins uh, through our food, um, unfortunately. Um, so there's, there's just toxins everywhere. And these kinds of things, of course, are threatening to our body as well. And they will trigger those mast cells, those essentially protective guards of our body to uh, alarm, um, to sound the alarm for the rest of the body. Um, one of the things that we're also seeing is estrogen dominance can cause uh, a, an issue with more histamine release as well. So um, I'm gonna talk about that in a moment, but just to go back to the toxin issue, this is one of the reasons why I think it's so important to just regularly do uh, metabolic detoxes or build into your everyday life um, things that help to support uh, natural detoxes like just great um, green leafy vegetables and cilantro and uh, herbs that are great like bitter herbs for great for your liver and gallbladder for example um, so important to just keep uh, eliminating toxins on a regular basis okay let's move on to the estrogen dominance component Okay, I've talked about estrogen dominance a lot because uh, I love talking about hormones. Um, but this one is an issue that we're gonna see more and more and more uh, both in both men and women. I think this is uh, an issue. Again, one big reason is because of our, the environmental toxins that we're exposed to. Unfortunately, um, there's a whole bunch of environmental toxins that are what are called endocrine disrupting chemicals meaning that they can actually uh, cause imbalances in our hormones and many of them act like strong estrogens to our body, uh, basically increasing the activity of estrogen in the body. There are other things like stress that can actually reduce the activity of progesterone. Uh, and so putting that, combining that together, we have too much estrogen activity and too little progesterone activity, that imbalance is an estrogen dominance. That's what we call it that. So estrogen dominance, uh, you may recognize that as very heavy or long uh, menstrual periods. Uh, we see this pretty commonly in um, women who are in their 30s, 40s, 50s, um, perimenopausal, you can have oftentimes PMS symptoms at the same time. Um, there's you know, changes with uh, nutrition, like having just more sugar um, and can also contribute to just having that higher estrogen level. Um, having more weight on can actually contribute to your estrogen levels as well. And again, that uh, environmental toxin load is a significant part of this as well. Um, and Again, this is for both men and women, um, estrogen activity can be disrupted. So, uh, of course, first of all, make sure you're checking your uh, beauty products, uh, cleaning products, um, that they're 
don't have those endocrine disrupting chemicals. Um, I often use the EWG.org, that's the Environmental Working Group. They have a database for cosmetics and they have a database for cleaning products, I think it was, household products, that you can sort of check to see if that product um, has any um, harmful products or harmful ingredients or potentially harmful ingredients. And if that product isn't in the database, you can also just actually check the ingredients on there as well, what they consider to be harmful. So that's a good way to check those products. Um, but what happens with estrogen, and particularly the strong estrogen, so we're talking about estradiol, uh, the strong estrogen is that it triggers the body to release more histamine, and it also reduces the histamine breakdown. So we're talking about in that bucket analogy, there's more histamine coming in and there's less going out. So obviously we're gonna fill up that bucket more because of that estrogen. So this is why I think um, we're seeing more histamine intolerance in women compared to men. And I suspect that we're seeing more histamine intolerance in perimenopausal women, because this is when we often see estrogen dominance. Uh, there's a lot that we can do for estrogen dominance. Please look back on our videos um, for that. Um, Again, nutrition and lifestyle can be so powerful for this. Um, severe menstrual cramps can also be linked to histamine. Um, unfortunately, there are um, mast cells that release histamine are in the uterus as well, so they can be uh, contributing to cramps in that way as well. So oftentimes you'll see this whole uh, pattern altogether, strong estrogens um, and uh, bad cramps uh, as well. Uh, symptoms like headaches and migraines just before periods can also be part of that uh, PMS uh, pattern um, and can be triggered by histamine. Um, fun fact is in, in when we're pregnant, the placenta actually makes a whole bunch of DAO enzymes. So uh, it can actually help our body to break down histamine better than we normally would. Um, so pregnant women tend to experience less histamine-related symptoms. Um, so yeah, and I will add uh, some of the estrogen dominance um, links from previous videos and things like that just to, for you to reference. If you think that that is um, a big issue for you, that's driving some of your histamine symptoms. Okay, the third most common cause that I see for histamine intolerance is that damage of the gut lining, as I had mentioned before. Um, we've talked about leaky gut um, or uh, damage of the lining of the gut, and this can result from numerous different things. Um, it could be because of uh, continuous use of some common anti-inflammatory medications known as NSAIDs, um, ibuprofen, Advil, Aleve, that kind of thing. It can come from chronic stress as well it can be food intolerances or sensitivities. It can be because there's a gut yeast or bacterial overgrowth uh, that's causing that chronic inflammation and therefore the breakdown of that lining of the gut as well. Uh, remember that a lining of the gut is what actually produces the DAO enzyme. Uh, and that's the one that actually can break down histamine. So this is super important. If the gut is compromised, we can't clear the histamine that we are constantly ingesting. And by the way, there's no such thing as trying to cut out histamine completely. We need histamine to be healthy. It's part of a protective mechanism in our body. Um, so it, there, it's not about trying to get rid of it completely. It's about having that right balance um, between ingestion, production, and breakdown. So. Uh, this is the reason why if we have the um, leaky gut or gut damage, um, we can have things like skin flush, indigestion, nasal congestion, um, headaches that seem to be triggered when we eat. And there are certain foods that might be actually triggering it more. So uh, I will add some links about gut inflammation and, and how to address it. Um, in the summary notes as well, just if you want to go dive more into that. Um, 
but this is a really, really big one. If there's leaky gut, if there's bacterial overgrowth, like small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, like SIBO, um, this is something that we can see. Oftentimes, when we address things like uh, yeast or bacterial overgrowth, we see an improvement in skin flushing, as in uh, rosacea, um, at the same time. So this histamine and gut connection uh, can often be seen uh, when we're uh, improving gut health. So that's a really exciting thing that we get to see with that, on top of just feeling better when we're digesting food. Now there are multiple triggers. Um, I'll mention a few of them here because many, many things can actually trigger the release of histamine in the body. Even just temperature changes, going from like a, a warm um, house to going outside in the cold can trigger histamine. Um, insect bites can trigger histamine. Um, certain foods can trigger it, even exercise. We, we even have day and night um, rhythmic changes in the natural levels of histamine changes in the body. Um, so more people may experience histamine symptoms uh, like early, early in the morning, for example, or when they wake up. Um, and of course, I mentioned the genetic factors as well, um, beyond just what's genetics behind the DAO and the HNMT enzymes. There's other um, enzymes that can make this worse as well. Um, and that can actually influence histamine metabolism. Uh, these factors generally just aggravate the symptom or symptoms in those people who already have high histamine levels in the body. So again, it's not about trying to just get rid of all of the histamine in the body. We definitely don't want that. Uh, but it's really about that balance uh, between um, too much coming in uh, and not enough being broken down. Um, one of the important things that histamine does is that uh, not only does it sound the alarm to start with uh, potentially um, attacking foreign invaders, for example, like pathogens, it, histamine to our brain actually helps us be alert and focused. Um, that's why some of us have experienced taking antihistamines and feeling kind of dopey and sleepy afterwards. Um, yeah, histamine is super important in a lot of these different ways, including the immune system as well. So trying to find that balance is what we're going for. Uh, one of the big things that we uh, want to always ask ourselves is why is our body all in this constant protective mode, right? What's happening with uh, histamine intolerance is that there's just so like a hair trigger that's causing more histamine production. So um, essentially your mast cell security guards are just totally overworked. And now they have a hard time identifying between the enemy invaders and um, friendly food delivery people, right? They, they are seeing everybody as um, a, a threat, essentially. And then so they're going to sound the alarm nonstop. So this is something that we have to make sure we're looking at is it stress that's uh, constantly triggering these mast cells? Is it the estrogen levels? Is it there's a toxicity that's there that we're not aware of? Um, or is it gut health issues? Um, or maybe a combination of these things that is triggering all of this to happen. Now, knowing all of these different t triggers and common causes then, how do you actually address histamine intolerance then? Okay, there is first of all no definitive test for histamine intolerance. One of the first things that we need to do is to first of all rule out the true allergies, right? Like we talked about with the skin prick test, but also um, confirm the, the uh, diagnosis of the histamine intolerance by essentially removing a lot of the histamine triggers and confirming that yes, you do feel better with that. Um, so in order to do that, one of the, the common things that we can do is just following a lower histamine diet. So foods are high in histamine, uh, foods that are high in histamine tend to be foods that are cured, fermented, cultured, uh, aged, um, 
maybe I'm mentioning all of your favorite foods. If you think about like a charcuterie board, it's like, that's like a histamine explosion, um, especially with the red wine with that. Um, but it's the processing of these foods uh, where the histamine content uh, essentially increases. So even leftovers um, can have greater amounts of histamine, uh, canned foods, or foods like bone broth that are simmering at that low temperature for a long time can create uh, greater histamine content and can end up being problematic for some people. Uh, there are foods that can also actually slow down your ability to break down uh, histamine. So these are foods like black tea or even green tea can reduce the ability of your body to break down histamine. And then there are foods that can trigger your body to produce and release more histamine. And these are things like milk, uh, strawberries, bananas. Uh, so in the beginning, it's a good idea to just avoid many of these uh, big trigger foods. Um, so let me give you just a little bit of a list and I'll make sure to write down the, the, this list in the summary as well. Um, this, this is a good place to start avoiding these types of foods. It's, this is often called a low histamine diet. And generally we're doing this for three or four weeks is a good enough time to see if it actually helps. Um, and, and it sounds like a lot of different foods, but there's actually a lot more that you can have. And these are just really the big ones. Um, and everybody is different in terms of the susceptibility. So, here are some of the higher, um, these are some of the foods to avoid if you're doing a low histamine diet. Okay, so these are things like alcoholic beverages, especially wine, champagne, and beer. These are fermented foods like sauerkraut, pickles, uh, vinegar, uh, kombucha, kimchi, things like that. And then most cured aged meats, bacon, pepperoni, uh, lunch meats, hot dogs, things like that, and smoked fish as well. And then dairy, um, especially soured or cultured dairy, like aged cheeses or buttermilk. Um, there aren't actually a lot of grains on this list, but wheat is usually uh, the worst one and corn can be an issue for some people too. Generally, most fruits are well tolerated, um, but avoid things like dried fruits. And then there's just a few, like I mentioned, the strawberries, bananas, um, as well as pa papaya and pineapple can be an issue. And sometimes citrus can be an issue as well. Uh, just a couple nuts like walnuts and cashews. Just a few vegetables. So these are some of my favorite vegetables. Tomatoes, avocados, spinach, mushrooms, and eggplants. But besides these, most fresh vegetables are really well tolerated. Um, a couple other sort of miscellaneous things, cacao or chocolate, cinnamon, nutmeg, can actually trigger a little bit more of the histamine uh, reactions. Um, and then I mentioned black and green tea because they block the breakdown of histamine. Um, and then things like artificial preservatives, food dyes, food additives, things like that um, can be a problem as well. And then I mentioned before leftovers and canned foods um, can be become an issue on top of that. So these are just kind of a list of foods that um, we generally avoid for about three or four weeks to see if that helps you calm down those histamine reactions um, and essentially confirm that it is a histamine intolerance uh, issue. But of course, these many of these foods are very healthy foods, so we want to reintroduce them as soon as possible. And so what we want to do is keep them out for a short time as possible, confirm what we think that it is histamine intolerance, and then in the meantime, work on some of those underlying causes, right? Estrogen dominance, gut issues, adrenal issues, working on those. And oftentimes when we do that, we can start to slowly reintroduce some of these foods. Many of them uh, may be better tolerated at that point. Some of them, it might be just hard to, um, tolerate you know for a long time like some of these ones that are big like alcohol uh, can be a little bit more difficult but I certainly have seen that you can tolerate a little bit more um, you know maybe not four glasses but one glass without having a headache for example uh, of red wine where before the treatment couldn't tolerate it 
at all. So there's a ability to recover pretty well with this one as well. So again, seems like a long list, I know, and it's a little bit overwhelming um, in the beginning, but again, it's just for a finite amount of time, and there are actually way more foods that you can have, you know, freshly cooked meats and fish, flash frozen fish, gluten-free grains, most of the fruits and vegetables are good to go. Most nuts and seeds are well tolerated and herbal teas and even coffee is well tolerated usually. So there's a lots that we can have. Um, of course, keep in mind with any elimination diet, um, when we're taking foods out, these are foods that tend to be higher in histamine or they cause your body to make more histamine or block the histamine uh, breakdown. But we have multiple different potential reactions to food besides just histamine, right? We, it could be that you have actual true allergies or you have intolerances or food sensitivities as well. So um, this list that I'll provide for you here is just a starting point. Two people with histamine tolerance can have different reactions uh, to different foods. So it's, it's really just a starting point and uh, being really strategic with the food reintroduction phase is really important for figuring out your personal food reactions. Um, you know, some of these foods, of course, you know, maybe limiting alcohol and artificial preservatives are probably beneficial for most people. Um, but the many of those other foods, uh, like avocados um, and fermented foods, are super healthy. So we want to we want to get those back in um, as soon as we can. So doing a low histamine diet is really just one piece of a larger treatment plan. So please don't do a low histamine diet. Uh, indefinitely, make sure that there's a strategy involved with that. Um, oftentimes, while you're doing the low histamine diet, um, I like to, in com combination with that, do a few nutrients and herbs that can help to just stabilize the mast cells and make them less uh, susceptible to releasing um, histamine. Um, and it's a good time to do that because generally with a lower histamine diet, the symptoms are already calming down. You're generally, if it is histamine intolerance, you're feeling better um, and the nutrients can help to just um, control uh, some of the extra little symptoms that you're having as we're trying to figure out the deeper imbalances that cause the histamine intolerance in the first place. That's really what we're trying to get to. So essentially we're, we're going through this um, process to empty the bucket, right, in our analogy. So addressing stress, addressing the adrenal uh, health, addressing the poor gut lining or the gut lining damage that's there, and then addressing estrogen dominance, all of these things can help to empty out that bucket so that we don't have so much histamine being built up and accumulating in the body. Um, I hope that makes sense so far. Um, um, I want to just make sure that when I was planning for this masterclass, I realized that I had written notes that was probably enough for a four hour lecture. So I don't want to overwhelm here, but I want to give an introduction just so that you feel comfortable with me, maybe identifying this in yourself or in other people so that you can do a little bit more investigate, uh, investigating and uh, figure out um, if this is an issue and why it's actually developing in your body. And again, this is something that responds really well to diet and nutritional and lifestyle modifications. So uh, it's, it's something that I would highly recommend just looking into and um, don't brush things off as just allergies um, as I have all done for years myself. Um, there are changes that are happening and the histamine um, intolerance could be this really important indicator of these um, underlying imbalances that are going on. Um, that is most of what I wanted to talk about today. Do let me know if you have any questions right off the bat here or if you wanted to hear more about histamine intolerances and uh, what to do about it and how do you know that you have it. Um, I think histamine intolerance can really impact our lives every single day and it could be just in mild ways or it could be really severe symptoms and very uncomfortable symptoms. 
Either way, it's an indicator that there's something deeper going on, so I highly recommend looking into it further. Um, if you've noticed uh, that you have more um, uh, environmental toxicity issues, um, or if you suspect that you have uh, hormone imbalances that might be driving this, um, I definitely uh, start looking into, first of all, confirming that this is a, an issue for you, and then as you're reducing the uh, histamine that you're taking in by diet, um, start looking at um, actually addressing those deeper imbalances. Rabina says, I wanna hear more about histamine intolerance. Okay, cool, I'm glad to hear that. Then uh, I will consider uh, sharing a little bit more. I just did not want to overwhelm you today, but it is a topic that I am super passionate about and that it's, it's very, very interesting. And I think that we are gonna see more and more of the, about this coming out. I think it's, we just have this sort of perfect storm uh, right now of contributing factors. And um, so unfortunately, I think we are gonna be seeing more of this. Um, yeah, I'm glad that you're finding it interesting. Thanks for your comments there. Uh, I look forward to um, sharing more about this. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. I will definitely have a summary notes with the list and the links to uh, estrogen dominance and uh, leaky gut and all of that coming out. Uh, thanks, Donna, for your talk, for your comment there. Um, and of course, we will be talking again soon. I will be back on Monday uh, to talk about preventing cold sores and shingles as well. So I'll see you then. Have a fantastic weekend. Talk to you next time. Bye.